And hello, everyone. Welcome. Today, I want to talk about my most popular book. It's called The Myths and Mysteries of Marriage. There it is. Let me hold it up for you. This is um, the most popular book. I don't talk about it a lot, but I should talk about it more. Let me read a little bit from the back cover of the book. Why do couples argue? How can we put the sparkle back in our marriage? How can we communicate better? What is the difference between courtship and casual dating? My wife asked me to leave. What should I do? Why are men the way they are? Why does my wa what does my wife want? Can we reconcile? My wife cheated on me, now what? So you see, these are pretty important topics. See, what I want you to understand is that um, the human being has a soul, so we're more than just flesh and blood. We're more than just animals. And we have a physical aspect to ourselves, but we also have a psychic a aspect. And the psychic is actually the most powerful. But the, the two interreact. And the, what should uh, predominate, or what should be in the lead, is love and faith. And how, do you, how can you have love and faith? Well, it's by being in rapport with your Heavenly Father. Yes, I'm going to use the term Heavenly Father. Because Father is a very important thing. Why is Father so important? Have you ever noticed that? I remember that many times with people, it's like, you know, sometimes mom will do bad things or yell or scream or whatever. And the kids will say, oh, that's just mom. But when dad messes up, the whole family suffers. It's a big time thing when dad messes up. Fathers are very important. And why? Because on this earthly plane, remember I said we have we have a body and, and a soul, or a soul and a body. We have a psychic aspect and a physical aspect. And I said they both in, interact. And there's also psychological. You could say you could say matters of the soul. Then there's the psychology, and then there's the physical or biological. So. On the earthly plane, the Father represents God. He usually doesn't do a very good job of it, but nevertheless, he holds the station of fatherhood. And so that's a very important station. And so the secret, the key is to not resent your dad. Even, even if he messes up, don't resent him. Sure, you can see that he's messed up or see that he's wrong, but don't resent him because there's something about resenting father that is um, akin to resenting God. And I would say that people who resent their father also resent God. See, we sense at some deep, unplumbed level that father is supposed to represent God. So father is supposed to be have wisdom, courage, kindness, long-suffering, patience, honor, virtue like a prince. But when father messes up, well, and we resent him, then it, um, and see, and, and fathers are resentable, aren't they? Because they make, because they have feet of clay. It'd be better if father didn't mess up. Some fathers hardly mess up at all. Or when they're young, they make some mistakes. You know, they resent their wife, there's fighting and, you know, that kind of stuff. But then as they get older, they get wiser. And some men are actually quite, quite good. But the thing is, you, ha you have to go all the way. Men, you have to go all the way. It's not good enough just to be nice, a people pleaser. It's not good enough just to be um, a sort of a noble person. You know what I mean? A, a highway patrol officer or a police officer or a fireman or something, you know, something, no, but it's not enough. You have to 
you have to find a rapport with the Heavenly Father, find a rapport within. And then, and then He operates through you. So then the love that you have for your family, it's not your love, it's His love. But now getting back to, um, to the importance of fatherhood. So now can you see that, um, see we keep, we keep coming around full circle. The whole, ra the whole, have you ever wondered, this morning I was, I, was, um, I was sitting outside of Starbucks, I got a coffee to go and I was sitting in my car. I, I like to do a little bit of reading, a little bit of writing and drink a little coffee. And I was watching the people come and go. And then I realized all of a sudden that, um, that uh, becoming couples is, is a really big deal. Have you ever noticed that? Men are looking for women, women are looking for men. Their whole life revolves around finding someone and marriage is a big deal. A lot of people want to get married. It's just really a big deal. And I, want, I wonder why is that? Because, you know, you've heard the old joke. I'm sure you've heard the joke that uh, one, one man said that life is like, or excuse me, that marriage is like a three ring circus. And the other person said, well, how's, how is marriage like a three ring circus? He said, well, first there's the engagement ring, then there's the wedding ring, then there's the suffering. And that's kind of the way it is a lot of times, isn't it? But it doesn't have to be that way. Or if there's suffering, then the suffering can wake you up. It can wake you up to realize that somehow you're, you're, you're resenting your partner. You have expectations of, of them that uh, you, and you, you want something from them and you resent them when they don't. See what I mean? That sort of thing. So the suffering can wake, wake you up. Or when you see the kids, when you and your husband are squabbling and you see the kids, you know, you see that it's not good and you begin to question and wonder, what's it all about? Well, um, so where was I? Oh, yes, so getting coupling is a big deal. But you see, it's kind of necessary. Yeah, not everybody gets married. Some don't. Some stay single. But uh, most people do, and there's a reason for it. Because that way, if you do it right, you can undo the legacy. See, see, the whole the human race, it started with Adam and Eve. And so what happened in the garden? That's the, that's the beginning of the race. And there's something of that, that, that history in all of us. And if you don't find the secret to, to, to solving these issues, if, if you aren't able to let go of the resentment toward your father, if you men don't see that what your wife is looking for is agape love, emotionless love, that comes through you when you have a really rapport with the Father. And if you men can't see that, that it's not good enough just to be nice and to be a people pleaser and to bring her flowers and candy, she'll just have contempt for you because she needs something else. She needs that, that nobility, that virtue, that honor, that um, strength, a gentle strength. That's what she needs to see in you. She probably didn't see it in her father so she resented her father. So now full circle. So the so the whole so that's the the race, the, the human race. And then you have to so you have to find the secret. And you ladies have to have to stop judging your husband. Your problem is judgment, judging every little thing that he does, and comparing him to other men and, and hating him, and then feeling guilty for your judgment of him, and then going overboard to be too nice. So then you do nice things for him, and and you might spoil him or drive him off, but chances are you'll spoil him. And the more you do for him, see, unless, unless he's found the way, unless he's found that inner rapport, the more you do for him, the more spoiled he gets, the more of an animal he becomes, and then you resent him for that. And then you do more for him, and he becomes more of an animal, and he degenerates it be before your very eyes. You see what your love has done to your husband. You see him deteriorating. So... You have to see that you have to let go of judgment and you have to see that undoubtedly, not necessarily, but undoubtedly, you've transferred your resentment toward your earthly father who failed you to your, to your husband. You have to see all of that. Then marriage can be beautiful. 
you can live happily. So you work it out. See how? See, see why it's so important that humans come together so they can work it out. Work out the ancient legacy of the Garden of Eden. And for, for in our individual lives, we also have to come full circle. Undoubtedly, your, your father married um, a woman who supported him. And then, um, so you had that. And then that was the kind of program you got as a kid. You resented your dad. But then you went out, you men, you went out and you found a woman like your, like your, your, like your mother, undoubtedly. Or you tried to find one who was the opposite. But then, lo and behold, one day, she was like your, your mother. So there you are, full circle. So now, and then if you suffer for it, the suffer and the suffering causes you to, to cry out for answers. What, what am I doing wrong? See, where am I going wrong? Instead of blaming her, then you can find the answers and then it can be beautiful. And you ladies, it's full circle. You resented your dad. You go out in the world looking for a man. Lo and behold, he's like your dad. And then now what? Now it can be full circle. You can, you can learn to, to forgive your, let go of the resentment toward your husband. And then to begin to see um, the good in it. See, as long as you give him a really hard time, you know, most women give their husband a really hard time. As long as you keep giving him a hard time, he may not find himself. Now, he may. See, so you don't want to overdo the hard time stuff because it, 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 he, he will be reacting to you with resentment and anger and hostility and guilt and so on so much that you know you've heard the expression you know um you can't see the forest for the trees well he'd be so bu busy reacting to you and judging you and hating you and wondering what you want and scratching his head and being and trying to be nice and then resent angry again and all that he'll be so that'll be so much of that that he'll never find himself so you have to back off a little bit. Stop trying to change him. You can't change him. If you change him, you'll only make him into a man in your image. You'll be his God. Do you understand? You don't want that. So you have to give him a little space so he can find himself. Yeah, no, I know. There are some men that are just no good. You give them a little space and they just take advantage. And they're off with other women and stuff. Well, they're, they're just no good. So in that case, you know, it may be hopeless. You'd be better off without him, probably, you know, living in dignity on your own. But if he's halfway decent, see, most guys are halfway decent. You know, they're not terrible, terrible people, although there are some terrible ones. But if he's not super terrible, if he's just a regular guy, you know, he has some good qualities. He's not perfect, but he goes to work. He brings home a paycheck. He's the, you know, he's home on weekends with, with you and the kids and stuff like that. Then give him a little space, okay? And you men, well, you have to find your creator within. When you see your wife suffering, when you see your kids suffering, and you cry out for answers, then you begin to see, see that you, well, you, you made her into a god. You wanted something from her. You wanted her to support your ego. Make you feel like a real man, you see. So you were using her in that sense. And then if you resent her, then you're also using her. See? So you don't want to use your wife. She's she's like a flower. In the in the in the in the Bible it says that, that a woman can be more precious than rubies. See? She's a helpmate. And she's a human being. So you be you relate to her as a person not as an object of use. Do you understand? So then your touch, your voice, everything about you will, will convey that, um, res what's the word to use? The gentleness, kindness. And then it can be very beautiful. So we get married, we come full circle, Men end up with a wife like their mother. Women end up with a husband like their father. And if they can work it out, then they work out the ancient legacy of, um, of Adam and Eve. It can be beautiful. 
And so if you're, let's say you're a young person, you're thinking of getting married. Well, then who, who are you going to find? Well, I have a chapter on that too. Something about, uh, remember that chapter on courtship? I think that might be, uh, might be good. So the, the, um, there are some things, but definitely you, you, uh, you ladies should look for a man who, who, who has a love of principle. He has a little bit of fire in his belly for, for what's right, for justice, see, for truth. Something like that. A nice, a good, that quality is what you need to look for. Not that he's perfect, but then don't try to make him perfect, see? Look, look for that. So, I think I've, um, I've said enough. I made a 16-minute video here. I only wanted it to be a couple of minutes. It says you're based on over 20 years of counseling couples and answering questions on the radio. Well, now let's make it over 30 years. I wrote this book about 10 years ago. Counseling couples and answering questions on the radio. This, this is the Courtship, Marriage, and Relationship Repair Handbook you have been waiting for. That's pretty good. I wrote that. Not bad, huh? For Roland tackles the tough questions with humor, discernment, and refreshing honesty. Well, if I do say so myself. From the Garden of Eden to the 21st century, he's got relationships covered. All right, that's good. So this is a very good book. You really should get it. I'm serious. If you're married, have issues, if you want to get married, if you're divorced, and then you're, you, you want to find out what happened. If you're not married and you just kind of would like to have a glimpse as to what went wrong with the relationship between your parents, then uh, this would be an excellent book. A lot of people have gotten it. This is, I've written two, well, th three or four books on relationships, but this is my first one, and I recommend you get this one first. You really, really should. So, enough said. Oh, it's on Amazon. It's on Amazon in uh, quality paperback and in uh, Kindle edition.